streaming. Good morning. And we thank those who contributed last week to the Neighbors in Need collection. Uh, if you uh, missed last week and, and missed the opportunity to give, uh, the, uh, the giving window is still open. The Pastoral Search Committee has invited Re Reverend Stephanie Salinas to preach here on October 24th as a potential pastor for our church. Four candidates expressed interest and two were invited for second interviews with the search committee. The committee has been working with the assistance of the UCC Florida Conference and following the guidelines to select, following the UCC guidelines to select candidates. Uh, Reverend Salinas' background and experience are outlined in the email newsletter that was sent out this week, but also in the handout uh, that you received when you came in. So if you didn't get one, we've got plenty of those. Grab one before you leave. She will be speaking here on October 24th uh, with the possibility of retaining her as our pastor. So a vote of the congregation will be taken immediately after the service on October 24th. Those who attend the service virtually, you will have the opportunity to vote after the service by text or by leaving a voicemail on Jim Wagoner's uh, cell phone and we'll, we'll make sure that you have that number we ask that you prayerfully consider Reverend Salinas and make every effort to attend the service on October 24th to participate in this important decision for our church. Please remember to fill out the insert that's in your bulletin, as we do every week to update the, the church directory, but also to put in your prayer requests. If you're watching online and have prayer requests, we encourage you to send those requests to the office so they can be included in the bulletin for next week. Today, we welcome back to the pulpit Reverend Drew Willard, who has visited with us before. He is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and serves churches in both Connecticut and has served churches in both Connecticut and Florida. So now, if you would please stand and join me in reciting our mission statement. We exist to welcome all people into a relationship with Jesus Christ, equip people with a faith that works in real life, and sends us in service into the world in Jesus' name. Now remain standing for our first song. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh. 
strength is failing. The end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. And bless the pray. Lord God, we are here before you today to worship your holy name. We ask that you bless our time together. We thank you that all of us that have arrived here this morning have a place where we can worship you with all our hearts, minds, and our souls. We ask that you be with those that are worshiping online with us this morning. And those that couldn't be here, for whatever reason, they couldn't be. Lord, we give this time to you. Speak to us. And let us totally connect with what you would want us to know this morning. We pray all of this in your son's holy name. And all people say amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship by singing crown him with many crowns. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> there we go.
Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here again with you in this beautiful space and with your music and creativity. I can just see you're, you're on the verge of something I think that will be new and exciting for this community. I think we've been challenged in ways by this pandemic to find new ways to connect, to reassess our resources, and to re-examine our mission as, as Christian people. Friends, I invite you now to a time of prayer, a time of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. I want to lift up, first of all, the names of people on your prayer list. Bill Wilkinson, Alan Campbell and family, Sarah, Kyle, Landon, Landon Bono, Raina, Vince, Patty, Jim, Mary Beth, Kathy Olson, Tom Scott Sr., COVID victims and families, our church and leaders. Friends, I invite you to prayer. Almighty and merciful God, we give you thanks for this day of life, for family and for friends. Oh God, our world is burning. There is unrest and challenge everywhere. Deliver us from the pandemic of virus and the epidemic of violence. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to know our narrative, that we may listen with patience, question with civility, stay engaged, and to act when that is called for, to speak up. Gracious God, bless our families and friends, our loved ones near and far, the creatures in our care. Bless the communities and creatures in your care. We pray for all are faced with some challenge of body, mind, and spirit. We pray for, we pray for healing. We pray for healing. We pray for those whom no one prays for, those who are perhaps too angry to pray for themselves, who have even been enemies to us. We pray for healing and reconciliation. When someone is at the end of their life, may they not be afraid, but trust that you are a good God. We pray for those of us who are, we ask that those of us who love them, that we be encouraged and encouraging. When someone has gone home to you, O oh God, we pray for consolation as we miss and mourn them. In all these things, we look to you as the source of our help and hope. And this time, now in silence, we lift up our individual prayers to speak to you as a beloved one who holds us to be faithful to our best selves. And now we pray that prayer that you taught your disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite Sue McMahon to come forward for the children's message. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? What, what uh, holidays coming up at the end of the month? 
Halloween, that's right. There are a lot of what I would call spooky, scary images that uh, we see this time of year. And today I have two pumpkins that I want to hopefully encourage you to think of those images a little differently. And I already have pumpkin guts on me. Note to self, don't wear white pants when handling pumpkins. <laughs> I made a boo-boo, so I have pumpkin all over me. I want you to think of this pumpkin as yourself. Pretend it's you. What do you get when you open up a pumpkin? Kind of a yucky. Ooh, this one's particularly juicy. Kind of all the guts are slimy and sticky and lots of seeds. That's kind of the bad stuff in us. Think of it like if you're, when you lose your temper or maybe you tell a little white lie or maybe you cheat on a test. Those are the bad things. Now, when God comes into our life, what happens to the inside of the pumpkin? He cleans it out, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Takes all that nasty stuff out. He makes room for all the good things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. And he puts a big, whoops, I almost lost my pumpkin there. He puts a big smile on your face. He puts a light in your heart so that you can think of a jack-o'-lantern this time of year a little differently. Think of it as God working in your life, cleaning all that stuff out, putting a big smile on your face and a light in your heart. That's called the pumpkin gospel, and I have good with me. <laughs> so let's say a prayer, and then uh, we have Sunday school today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for cleaning us out, putting good stuff in our hearts and minds so that when we go into the world, we can smile and show the light of Christ wherever we go and whoever we talk to. In your son's name, amen. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Sumi and um, Scott were putting together the worship uh, plan for today, and they asked me to do something I haven't done in a long time, and that's the invitation to give. Um, I've heard it described as the tough part of the service because it's about money, but I want to talk to you a little differently about it today. Do any of you dream? I do. And I had one particular dream. <laughs> Elaine's saying yes. <laughs> one particular dream I want to share with you. Years ago, Mr. Chris and I, as well as our kids, did a lot of mission work in the Appalachian Blue Ridge Mountain area. This one particular year, uh, about a week before we were supposed to go, on the mission trip, I had a dream that I was going to be building a stained glass window. Now that's weird. I mean, go on a mission trip and build a stained glass window? That's just strange. So I went about my usual preparation for the trip. Every summer, I'd go to the thrift store and I'd buy some old jeans and some old t-shirts because we did a lot of painting and construction work, and it was dirty work. So I packed all my clothes. We drove to Asheville, North Carolina, pulled up into the church where we were using their Sunday school classroom as our, our campgrounds. You know, we put our sleeping bags out, and we had a, that's where we stayed for the week. As we drove up into the parking lot, there's this stained glass window with a huge, crack in it. The group, the week prior, the youth group, the week prior, had been playing kickball. And guess what happened? The ball went right through the window. So I said, hmm, well, money was tight. I didn't have extra cash on me to do that kind of project. And I had not brought my stained glass supplies. You know, I didn't listen to the dream. So I got dressed Monday morning to go out and do the construction work in my thrift store jeans. 
put my hands in the pockets, put my keys in for the car, pulled out a $20 bill that had been in those jeans the whole time, unbeknownst to me. <laughs> my point is that God provides just enough at just the right time, and that we all have dreams for this church. And I'd like you to be a part of that. So if ushers would come on up, it's time to put your hands in your pockets. <laughs> we'll say a real quick prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we collect the offering today, help it to be just enough at just the right time to do the dreams that we have for this church and that they all glorify you in your son's name. Amen. And I all. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Yes. 
Taking all I have and now I'm laying it at your feet. Now we're reading from Mark. And the band, what, what do you all call yourselves? Scott and Catherine and Jim and, okay, multi-talent. And thank you, Sue McMahon. And thank you, AV people. Thank you for all the roles that you play in making the liturgy, the work of the people happen. I'm going to tell a paraphrase of the following text. And that's actually Mark chapter 2, verse 23 to Mark 4, 23. And then pick it up with chapter 5, 21 to 43. And uh, this is a two-part story. You'll get the first part today, which basically is a day in the life of Christ. Uh, the next part will be at the end of the month on Halloween, a very appropriate uh, uh, for the story that I'll, I'll tell you then. And uh, no spoiler alert for, for right now. Just uh, that that will be a good, good story for then. So here now, this story about a Sabbath day, a day in the life of Christ. And Jesus arrived on the Sabbath day, going through fields of wheat. And his disciples had come along and proceeded to pluck heads of grain to eat. Now the Pharisees said, See here, why are they doing work that is not permissible on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Don't you recall what David did when he was desperate and hungry, and for those who followed him? And Abiathar was high priest. Was it, how was it right for David to enter the house of God and eat the consecrated bread which no one but the high priest is permitted to eat? Yet he ate it, and so did those who followed him. And Jesus said to them all, The Sabbath was created for the sake of humanity, and not humanity for the sake of the Sabbath. Therefore, the one who is the Son of Man, the true heir of humanity, is also the Lord of the Sabbath, the day for remembering the multitudes of creation. And so Jesus entered the synagogue at Capernaum. Now a man with an undeveloped hand was there, and they waited to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so they could bring charges against him. Jesus said to the man with the unformed hand, Stand in our midst. And he said to them all, Is it permissible on the Sabbath to do something nice or to do something evil, to save a life or take one? But they festered in silence. And he looked around at them, bitterly grieved at the intransigent hardness of their hearts. Jesus said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was regenerated, and immediately they went out to work on how they would destroy Jesus. And Jesus walked over to the Galilean Sea with his disciples and a huge crowd. There were a multitude of many people who had come just because they'd heard about what Jesus had been doing. They came from Galilee and Judea, from Jerusalem and Edomia, region around Tyre and Sidon, beyond the Jordan. And they come just because they'd heard about what he had been doing, and Jesus was able to relieve a great deal of suffering. And he said to his friends, set a board aside for me so that the crowd doesn't crush me. Many people had come to be healed. Then a man with an evil spirit was healed, falling down, shrieking as it was uprooted, you are the Son of God, by Jesus firmly reprimanded. And he said, spirit from announcing what he was doing. Jesus climbed up a hill, and he called for some of them to approach. There he formed a group of twelve whom he appointed as missionaries, so that as his companions he would send them out to preach with the power to cast out devils. Thus Jesus created the twelve and laid his hands upon them, naming them. Simon Peter, the rock, Jake Zebazeson, and his brother John, surnamed Thunder and Lightning, Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, Jake, Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, 
Simon the Patriot, and Judas the Dagger, who would eventually betray Jesus. And they came back to Jesus' mother's house in Capernaum. Now, there was such a crowd throng about, they couldn't even get in for lunch. Meanwhile, Jesus' mother and his brothers and sisters heard a terrible commotion. And they went outside to restrain Jesus because it sounded like he was going out of his mind with rage. And religious experts from Jerusalem taunted Jesus, saying, It is by the Lord of the flies and the chief of the devils that you cast out demons. And Jesus counted them with parables. How would Satan cast itself out? Like a throne divided, would it not collapse? Like a house divided, would it not fall down? Thus Satan divided the land with a crash. But no one enters a bully's house, his goods to take. Yet first this bully bound I'll make, and then the goods go free. And is it not for their sake? Then they said, it is he who has evil spirit. And because of this, Jesus was furious. All the sins and curses committed by humanity will be forgiven. But misrepresenting good by calling it evil is to be blind to the spirit of what is good. And that cannot be undone by anyone. Except oneself. By this time, Jesus' mother and brothers and sisters had arrived. They were calling out for him to stop, but they couldn't reach him through the crowd. Someone said, look, your mother and your brothers and sisters are here, and they're calling for you. And Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers and sisters? And looking around at those gathered about, he said, here are my mother and my brothers and sisters. Anyone who does the will of God, which is simply to love, is my mother, <laughs> my brother, my sister. Again, Jesus went to teach beside the sea. And as a huge crowd gathered before him, he climbed into a boat just offshore and sat down while all the people remained on the beach. And he began to teach them with parables. And in his teaching, he said, listen, imagine. A farmer went out to sow, and while casting seed, some fell along the street. The birds came and ate them up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where there was not a lot of dirt, and soon sprang up despite the shallow soil. But with the rising of the sun, they were scorched, and having no deep roots, they withered away. Other seed fell among brambles, where the thorns thrive, but these seeds yielded no grain. Finally, some seed fell into prepared ground where they grew up and yielded grain 30 times, 60 times, and 100 times as much as was planted. Whoever has ears that can hear had better be listening. Thus Jesus began to answer those who came to him with questions, teaching them only with parables. And he said to his disciples, To you the mysteries of the beloved community have been revealed, but to outsiders it will be just storytelling. They will look and look but not see. They will listen and listen but not hear. Unless they turn themselves around. Unless they cultivate their hearts. So as even to be able to forgive and accept forgiveness. And Jesus didn't say anything to anyone that wasn't a parable. But to the disciples, he explained how these stories were to be understood. The word of God is the seed that is sown. So it's like the word on the street. But when hearts that are street wise hear it, the enemy immediately snatches away the word that was sown in them. When the word has been cast upon hearts like rocky ground, they initially receive it with joy, but when oppression and persecution arise against the word, they fold to temptation. When the word has been cast upon hearts overgrown with anxiety, they hear it, but they're always anxious about security and deceived by wealth wanting more and their lust crowds the word so that it yields no grain. Like seed planted into good soil, so are they who hear the word of God and yield 30 times, 60 times, and 100 times as many lives that are saved. 
Would anyone light a, light a candle and place it under a basket? Wouldn't it be better if the lamp was on its stand? <laughs> but whatever things are hidden, they will be revealed. Whatever secrets are whispered, they will be made known. Whoever has ears that can hear had better be listening. And throughout that afternoon, for that crowd of people, Jesus told stories on the beach. And at that Sabbath day's end, Jesus and his disciples sailed to the other side of the sea. And they had marvelous adventures, stories for another time, which I will tell you when I return. And with the rising of the sun, Jesus and his disciples sailed back to the Jewish Galilean side of the sea. And there, on the beach, was a huge crowd waiting for Jesus. And the moderator of that Capernaum synagogue approached him. Now look here. The moderator, whose name was Jairus, knelt down before Jesus and urgently begged him, My daughter is in the final stages of dying. Come and lay your hand upon her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with him, and a crowd accompanied them and closed in around them. Now among them was a woman who had a chronic menstrual condition. For 12 years she had suffered the treatment of many physicians, had spent her wherewithal, yet without improvement, even growing worse. And when she heard that this was Jesus of Nazareth, she said to herself, if I touch even the hem of his clothes, I will be made well. So she approached him from behind just to touch his clothes. Immediately she was released from her condition and knew this by how she felt in her body. And immediately Jesus sensed that power had gone forth from him. He turned around the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciples said, Ha! Look at this crowd thronging about you. Yet you'll say, Who touched me? But he searched for the one who did this. The woman was terrified and trembling. She knelt down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, my dear, my daughter, your faith has given you the opportunity for healing. Go in peace, and may you be spared from your suffering. And while he was still speaking, someone came up to the moderator and said, your daughter has passed away. Why trouble the rabbi at this point? But ignoring this, Jesus said to the moderator, don't be afraid, just trust me. And he wouldn't allow anyone to go with him except Peter the Rock, Jake, and Jake's brother John. Together they entered the moderator's house and it was filled with people crying out and loudly wailing. And Jesus said to them, Why do you distress yourselves and weep? The child is not dead, only sleeping. But they ridiculed him. So he drove them all out. And he took with him the father of the child and the mother who was already among those with Jesus. Together they went into the room where the little girl was, and Jesus sat down on her bed and took her by the hand. He said, Talita kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately she got up. She started running all around. After all, she was 12 years old. And immediately they were all going out of their minds with joy, so much so that Jesus was having to say, please don't say anything of what you know about this. Finally he said, oi, give us something to eat. This is a story that began with food and ended with food. It began with multitudes and ended with a family reunited. It began with hardened hearts and ended with hearts broken open for joy. Amen. <laughs> Today's scripture tells about a day in the life of Jesus, which happened to be a Sabbath day. Has there been a day like that for you in your life where there was not one more thing you could have put into it that, or that could have happened? This was such a day for Jesus and for those who followed him. And I imagine part of the appeal of being Jesus' disciple was just to follow, follow him around to see what he was going to do next. Now this story began with food and it ended with food. It began with multitudes and ended with a family reunited. It began with hardened hearts and ended with hearts broken open for joy. 
there appears to be an underlying theme to this set of stories between Mark chapter 2 to 5 that explores the nature of the human heart. It's not the heart of our anatomy, but the emotional and spiritual grounding for us as human beings. And that the heart is an important part of us that continues beyond this life. This text warns us that hearts that are closed will be vulnerable to prejudice and subject to judgment, while hearts that are open will have enough empathy as a guide in moral crises. So knowing somebody involved in a situation can make a difference for the good. In Jesus' confrontation with those religious experts from Jerusalem, he made the point that we will be judged, not so much for what we do or say, but for the habit of our hearts. How we make our choices, which is demonstrated in our words and deeds, is what appears to be more important to Jesus, and therefore God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus compared the festering of anger to murder. He compared calling someone by a dirty name to be a crime that deserved time, jail time. And if someone was in the habit of casually belittling others, they were already in hell because of their indifference. A hardened heart can't make choices because it is set in its ways. So having a hardened heart is the unforgivable sin. However, we all hold the key to our hearts and that we can change what we think and believe. This is especially possible when you know somebody involved in a situation because that will make a difference. When you care about somebody involved that is no longer academic or a theological question, it's personal. Empathy provides for the willingness to see and hear things from the perspective of someone you care about. And this creates the possibility to be emotionally moved to change opinions and beliefs. In this story, that didn't happen right away, but it did happen. Right at the beginning, on the way to the Capernaum synagogue, Jesus encountered people already suspicious of him as they complained about his disciples picking up grain to eat, which was a form of work on the Sabbath and technically against religious law. Therefore, when he entered the synagogue, they were waiting to pounce on him. And that was the occasion of if he would dare to heal the man with the deformed hand. However, when Jesus asked them outright if this would be a problem, they just sat and sulked in their hard-heartedness. There was a tipping point for Jesus himself to be angry, though, and that was when a crowd had formed at his mother's house in Capernaum. After Jesus had healed people by the shores of Galilee, and some religious experts zeroed in on his exorcisms as a way to sow doubt in people's minds by suggesting he was guided by an evil spirit. That was too much. And Jesus let them know in no uncertain terms that misrepresenting good by calling it evil is to, bl to be blind to the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love and truth. There is no forgiveness for someone who is so hardened such that they won't change their mind for the sake of truth and love. But didn't hardened hearts change? Didn't they break open at the end of this set of stories? This narrative about a day in the life of Jesus has a happy ending. And that's because when you know somebody, it makes a difference. 
In this case, that somebody involved was the daughter of the moderator, the leader of the Capernaum synagogue. The little girl was sick and dying, and there was no one else who could help except Jesus. When Jesus and his disciples sailed back from their adventures across the Sea of Galilee, they saw a huge crowd waiting for them, though it was not clear why, because some of them had wanted to arrest Jesus and kill him. This multitude waiting on the beach included the people of the synagogue, the Pharisees, the religious experts from Jerusalem, neighbors from Capernaum, but also people from Galilee, Judea, Edomia, and beyond, as well as Jesus' own mother and brothers and sisters. But then the moderator stepped forward to kneel before Jesus and ask him for help to heal his little girl. That took a lot of nerve for this man to risk going against the opinion of the religious authorities as well as the people of his congregation, but also Jesus himself who had been treated with disrespect. Yet without a word, Jesus went with him to help him, regardless of what was said and done before. Now, that woman with the chronic menstrual condition was also in the crowd, and she already trusted that Jesus could help her. She believed that just by touching his clothes, she would be healed. But doing this would also mean breaking a cultural taboo. That was because of her uncontrolled bleeding. And for her to touch him would be making Jesus ritually unclean. For that matter, her condition would have been especially unacceptable if she had been the wife of the leader of a religious congregation a Jewish synagogue. In my opinion of this text, that is exactly who she was. And the clue is 12 years. The 12 years that she had suffered many unsuccessful, expensive treatments, and so was cast out, unable to help as the wife of this religious official. And the 12 years as the age of that little girl, which suggests complications at childbirth, this child's birth. So for her to approach Jesus had also taken a lot of nerve to risk going against social custom, to risk confronting her husband again, to risk perhaps even to forgive him. We want things to end in a story where they all lived happily ever after. But we don't know that for sure in this story. What we do know is that they all were overjoyed when the little girl came back to life. With hearts broken open to joy and perhaps forgiveness and reconciliation as well. Earlier that day, Jesus got angry with those who falsely accused him, but he was just as quick to reconcile and claim kinship with anyone who would meet him halfway when he said, Here is my mother and my brother and sisters. Anyone who does the will of God, which is simply to love, is my mother and my brother and my sister. Isn't that what it takes to change things? to reconcile with people and restore families, neighborhoods, churches, synagogues, mosques, corporations, states, and nations. Because when you know somebody, it makes a difference. Amen. I invite you to reflect on this those situations of, of crises that involved ultimately somebody that you knew and cared about and perhaps changed your opinion, your thoughts, opened up your mind and heart. In silence, let us pray. 
And we listen past the sounds of the room and past thoughts that would distract us from that quiet place where God always waits. Amen. I just want to take one brief note to say that uh, uh, earlier I was told that uh, I was well, I was asked to do the children's sermon, and so I prepared that. And then I got the word that Sue had it covered, and to do that to that sermon, I'm not going to do another another uh, children's sermon, but I'm going to point out that similar. It was not a dream so much, but I realized after the fact that this, the sermon that I, this little message for the children I prepared actually relates to my message this morning. And I was going to show the kids uh, this image, which is the metamorphosis of a monarch butterfly. So it's all the little stages, Okay of that. And uh, this me the metaphor metamorphosis of a butterfly from the caterpillar to becoming the butterfly. Uh, there are different stages and it's often used to in Christianity to symbolize the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And it also is reminiscent for me as a teenager when I went to a summer camp and the theme was butterflies and cocoons. Well, monarch butterflies don't make cocoons. They have what's called a chrysalis. And those stages of that transformation are represented here. And as you can see, well, uh, if I was to walk around to each of you, there was a cat the caterpillar after it's eaten, it's fill of milkweed, hangs onto a branch, and then, uh, then what happens is the outside of the caterpillar peels away to reveal what's already inside. And that's this hardened shell called a chrysalis. And as the butterfly matures inside, the chrysalis becomes translucent. You can actually see the, the wings until finally it's growing so big that it bursts from its cocoon to be able to fill out its wings and fly away. If we look at this as also a metaphor for the heart, as we are growing up from our caterpillar stage as people, there's a point where we have to protect our hearts and you only have to look at the news to see all the terrible things going on and and how there is a tendency to harden ourselves to steel ourselves against these kind of things and the danger is if we allow that chrysalis to become a fortress then we don't allow what's really inside of us to, to come out and be expressed so in the notion of being born again, that message of Christ to be, we don't become something new. We don't become something different. We give up what is false and hurtful, angry and hateful to be who we really are. And that is something the world really needs these days. Thank you. I'm going to stand and sing together before we leave this morning. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. You are.
Friends, let us go forth out into the world to help bring peace, to listen for the dream, what the dreams, what visions you have yet to, to unfold before you. May you be blessed in your search for new pastoral leadership and be a congregation that is a light to this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome today. That's beautiful. Okay, you're doing a children's service next time I come, right? Okay. Good deal. Good deal.